as you're seated, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts 4. We'll be in verses 32 verse, through chapter 5, verse 11. They kind of go together. And so that's where we're going to be. The title of the sermon is Purging Sin from the Church. This is the Word of God. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, or Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out, buried her beside her husband, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. As we begin today, and before we just jump into our scriptures, I want to ask you a question. Is, as we read these texts, and this is one of the things that I've been wrestling with as well as I've been studying it this week and past couple weeks, is how serious is God about His bride, the church? How serious is he about this bride? How serious is he about it? How serious is he about the bride staying pure? How serious is he about his bride being holy? Repenting of sin. Looking to Christ. You see, this passage is a passage that Luke is showing us how we should keep our focus as a body in Christ to be pure, to be holy, to be repenting of sin, and this passage shows us how to be, because we are doing those things, how we are to be also united together in Christ, having one mindset, committed to Christ. That we would be a community, because we are committed to Christ, we are a community that cares about our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, all because we care for Christ. That we would be so sensitive to sin that we wouldn't let it take root and therefore, we wouldn't let it grow up and bear fruit, just like any seed that we, has ever been planted. If it grows, if it takes roots and it grows up, it's going to bear seed. It's going to bear fruit. And see, this is what has happened to Ananias and Sapphira, that the sin of hypocrisy, that they're seeing others being, being uh, just kind of accoladed, they wanted that too. And so they go and contrive this evil deed in their heart to say, oh, I'm going to give this, but I'm also going to keep some money. And so it's like this idea of hypocrisy. I'm showing that I'm going to give all and everyone's going to think that I gave everything, but I didn't. That's what got them. They let the sin of hypocrisy take root and then it bore fruit into action. 
And this passage is showing us a compare and a contrast, really. We see that from uh, chapter 4, 32 through 37, and then chapter 5, 1 through 11. It's a compare and a contrast as we look at it. We see that it's, uh, it's kind of showing what the church members should look like in a church and what they shouldn't look like in a church. And it's vivid. Once we get deep into it, it's graphic. Because up until now, there's been a lot of first things, right? There's been a lot of good it's like the Holy Spirit has come down, has bat it was kind of in a, a baptized and it filled the, the saints. And we got to see the gifts of it and everyone was speaking in their own language. They could hear it. It was visible. It was amazing. And then we saw how even though Satan tried to use external forces and, and tried to stomp down the name of Jesus Christ being proclaimed, it actually fanned the flame, right? And now the word went out farther and more, and now people are coming to Christ. Thousands, like Eric mentioned, up to like 20,000 plus people have come to Christ because the name of Jesus is just going forth. But today we see a first in the church. And this is what the Bible is really good at. It's giving the, the whole picture. We see the first sin in the church. The first sin is hypocrisy. The first sin is hypocrisy. You see, Satan, like I said, he's been using external forces, and now we see him going in and using internal forces to create drama, to create sin within the church, that if we can't slow it down, if we can't stomp the flame out, then we'll try to go inside and put it out. And from this point forward, this is something that every pastor has had to deal with, sin within the church. I know just in, in my time in being a small time being a pastor, it's dealing with members in the church and the sin and unrepentant sin has been one of the hardest things. And there's been some great loss with it. And it's, it's a hard thing. It's what Paul had to deal with. You know, when we look at the Apostle Paul and his life, everything he went to, what was his greatest concern? I mean, listen, I'm summarizing 2 Corinthians 11, 23, 23 through 27. You know, when we look at the Apostle Paul, and as the Apostle Paul kind of comes down to one of the greatest concerns for his entire life, this great man who's been through so much, he's been through everything basically the world could throw at him. It, 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 he's been imprisoned multiple times. He's taken countless beatings, he said. He's had near-death experiences. Five times, five times, he took and received the 40 lashes from the Jews. Five times, he says. Three times he was beaten with rods. Three times shipwrecked. He was drifting at sea. He's been in danger from rivers, robbers, in cities, and in the wilderness, false brothers. He said danger from the sea, hunger, thirst, exposure, cold, no food. But out of all those elements that he had suffered, what did he say was his greatest concern? He says in 2 Corinthians 11, 28 through 29, he continues, he says, apart from such external things, those are external, the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches who is weak without me being weak who is led into sin without my intense concern the greatest thing that daily stuck at him was his concern for the church and the concern of the church going in to sin that was his greatest concern Paul had an intense concern for the church being led into sin. So much so, that's what he, he wrote to in Romans 16, 17 through 18. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances. Keep your eyes on those who are causing drama. Why? Contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. He says, turn away from them. For such men are slaves not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites and their own smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. 
He's telling the church, keep eyes on those who are creating drama, right? Because that's not from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not from his heart. He says the same thing in Galatians 1, 6 to 7. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. See, by distorting the gospel, distorting the message, you're going into sin. And he goes on to say, let them be anathema. Let them literally be cut off. And so this is what he says in basically every one of his epistles. He's addressing something to the church. And he says in Philippians 2, 1 through 2, and he tells the Philippians, he says, Therefore, if there are any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. You see, the same concern also is the same thing that brought him joy. When the church was united, when the church had the one mindset, when the church had the same heartbeat, same mindset, same mission, same goal, which is on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what we see Luke here painting the picture of and the backdrop of a purified church, of a, a church of, of sharing of saints, of the church that is committed to Christ and what it looks like. And it's from this backdrop, from this moment in Acts 4, 32 through 37, then we'll see the covert sins of the saints. So first we see that the, the, communi uh, the committed unity of the saints. They were committed to one heart and one soul. Acts 4, 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And so right from the very beginning, He's addressing the one heart and one soul. And really what this is, this is on the backdrop of Acts 4, 31, which says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And it's from this boldness, this idea and this unity that they went out one heart Everything within them, with one mindset, they went out and spoke the word with boldness. They spoke the gospel of Christ. They went out with unity to speak. And that's what we see. They weren't filled with some selfish ambition. They were united in mind and mission. And that's what also we see that they were unified in. They weren't unified on their selfish greed. They weren't unified on their own mission in life. They were one body together with Christ on the same mission. That was their heartbeat. That is what they were looking for. You see, we cannot be unified if we're constantly seeking our own glorification. We can't be unified if we're trying to build ourselves up while stepping over others so to speak. We're to have the same mind and attitude which is in Christ. And how do we do this? It's not found within ourselves. It's not found within ourselves. That's why in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's how we are to proceed. That's how we are to go in unity by thinking of, of others greater than ourselves, by having humility, what does he say, in mind, right? So if I'm constantly thinking of my own glorification, of my own self-interest, that's not being humble, that's not being having humility, that's looking for selfish ambition, right? But we're to look to Christ by putting others above ourselves. And second part here we see is that if we're looking to Christ and we're looking to Christ as our example, we see the greatest example. He humbled himself to the cross to die for sinners in our place. And that's how the idea of being humble is putting others above ourselves, putting other interests 
That's how we're going to love. That's how we're going to reach out to the lost world when we're looking to spread the gospel, to speak with boldness, even in dangerous places, right? Because they were told, Peter and John were told, don't keep speaking the gospel. Don't keep preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. So when they talk about in boldness, they were talking about in the face of persecution, right? They were taught, and that's what we'll kind of get to see in the next part after uh, in Acts chapter five. But they were committed to loving as Christ loved, to seeking out the lost. The only way to do that is to humble ourselves and put other to Christ's interest above our own. But we also see that they were committed to sharing the gospel here in Acts 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, uh, to the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. So like I said, they were sharing the gospel, even in the face of per persecution, even though that they were forbidden to speak in the name of Jesus. And what were they preaching? Here again, we see what they were preaching. And I know we've talked about it. They were preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were making people face the fact that they had witness and they are testifying to their witness that they had seen the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's like someone coming up to you today and saying, hey, I've seen someone who was resurrected. You're going to have to face the truth of either A, I'm going to believe this or B, I'm not going to believe this, right? Because we understand people live and die. But no one is ever resurrected. So they're facing the fact that they are witnesses to the resurrection. Even though that they were forbidden. And I think the thing we take here is that we should never water down the gospel. Never. No matter if we're forbidden. No matter if persecution comes, no matter if they lock, put chains on the doors, take us to prison, that we never water down the gospel. You see, even though they were preaching and they were forbidden by the authorities, they preached with boldness. They preached the resurrection in the name of Jesus Christ, that he was the Lord and Savior. He was the Messiah you see, being healthy members of a healthy church means you bring the healthy message. You bring the message of the gospel. The fact that Jesus was resurrected, no matter if they think you're hypocrites, no matter if they think you're crazy, no matter if they persecute you, you never water down the message just to make it more palatable for someone to swallow. Because someone who swallows a watered down gospel is not the gospel. It's not. But you're to lay the message of the gospel down at their feet so they have to deal with it, so they can stumble over it. And unless someone falls flat on their face, they can't get up. The way we do this, we have to recognize that we are sinners in the presence of a holy God under his wrath just by breathing and unless we look to Christ, there is no salvation. There is no salvation. It is the message of God that they must stumble over. It's not being, me being militant. It's not me trying to be manipulative. It's not me trying to make it easier for someone. No, it's me bringing the message. It's you bringing the message. That's how we are to present and be bold in presenting the gospel and sharing it. That's how people come to faith. Listen to what Paul put down in Romans 9, 33. He says, as it is written, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And then he goes on, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. He's quoting Isaiah 28, 16. And that's exactly what we see the apostles doing. They're laying down the message of Jesus Christ. They're sharing the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus because that's the only hope for anyone is the resurrection, that he overcame death. He took the wrath of God in your place. 
There's the hope. And God said, through the resurrection, stamped, sealed, and approved, I accept that sacrifice. It's good. There's nothing we can do. That's the message. That's the message that people stumble over for thousands of years. And it's a message that we are called as healthy church members to bring. And we see that great grace, abundant grace was upon them all. I love this here. Mega grace. Megas. That's what that means. Great grace. And we see what this kind of meant also in Acts 2, 47. You see, that great grace is that favor of God was upon them. And what, what does that mean? That God was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, when we bring the message, you know, we might sow the seed, but it's God who gives growth. And that's only by God's grace. And what kind of grace is that? That is great grace. That's nothing that we have done. That's nothing. It's only God who gives growth. But we also see that this church was committed to being a sharing community. Not only were they looking to present the gospel, not only were they one in mind, heart, and soul, but they were committed to sharing. Now, I know a lot of people look at these verses and they go, ah, oh, bam, Christian communism. There it is, right? They see this and they go, oh, they, they must have shared everything. They put all their stuff together, then they dispersed it. But if you read it, that's not what that means. See, communism is the idea that we take, put it all together, and then we separate equally. That's, that's communism. That's not Christianity. Sorry. It's not Christian communism either. <laughs> no such thing. But once we kind of understand the context of this, you'll kind of see what it means, right? Because during this time, there weren't churches on every corner, guys, right? The, people had traveled to Jerusalem. People had moved from Jerusalem. That's what we saw with Barnabas. He was from Cyprus, but he had moved to Jerusalem, right? So people had moved there, traveled there, had no job, really had no land. They were in need, and so we see the church seeing that need and seeing that love for the brothers in Christ. They were liquidating their assets. And they would come down, so they would hold church services daily, right? And then they would come down at the apostles' feet and lay down their money. And the apostles then would distribute to those who had need. That's the way the system worked. They had daily giving, and so daily, people were selling, liquidating their assets to lay it down for those who had need. That's what the, the, the sharing of the community looks like. Seeing your brothers in need and caring for them sacrificially. That's what it looks like. And we see in, in verse 32b, it says, But none of them... And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. So they understood. We see a healthy view of what possession looks like here in the church for Christians. We understand that what God has blessed us with is not our own. But it's, they didn't look at it and go, oh, that's mine. That's, oh, that's mine. Yeah, uh-huh. No, they looked at it as saying that God had given them these goods so they could distribute to everyone who had need. And we see in verse 34, there was not a needy person among them. For as many were owners of lands or houses, sold them. They liquidated them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. See, what this doesn't, mean is that you should not work you know at one time in my life i was part of a church that kind of had the idea and it's not popular but it was kind of more of the opposite of the prosperity gospel they looked at this and kind of looked at the idea of communism and so it was kind of this idea of this uh poverty gospel and so it, it was a little different it was kind of a different mindset 
And so if you had need, you know, you would just kind of ship money around or funds around and, and you would kind of be a part of that. But it doesn't mean that we should not work. We should work. We should go out and make a wage. Right? That's biblical. And it doesn't mean that there weren't or rich people. It just means that those who had goods sold them to those to help those who are in need. And that's the right view of how we see giving should be. It should be sacrificial. In 1 Timothy, I kind of want to point this out, 6, verses 17 through 19. It says, for the rich in this present age, because he, he, he addresses that there, there are those who have goods, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertainty of riches. See, if you have goods, there's a way that you are to view. You're not to view yourself greater than someone who has none. All right? Nor are you to set your hope on your 401k or your retirement. But what? But on God. That's where we need to be at. That's where our minds and our heart needs to beat for, is to have our minds and heart set on God. Not on our riches, not on this world, but on God. Why? Who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Oh. Then, see, by keeping your eyes focused on God, you really see what your possessions should be, is that they are a blessing from God. Right? And they are to do good. See that? You're to use them for good. To be rich, not in, not in goods, not in possessions, but in good works. To be generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So where's that future? So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Your, your possessions is not your life. Your possession, which is truly life, is God. And what is this life? It's Galatians 2.20. It's to remember that you have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer what he says. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life, there it is, the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is how we are to view living life and being a part of a sharing community is that we are part of Christ and the same spirit that dwells in us dwells in our brothers and sisters who are in Christ and that we are to have a loving heart for them and a loving heart for the lost. And that we are to use our goods to, to do good works to seek after Christ. And Luke, he gives us an example of this as the commitment of a sharing person. In Acts 4, 36 through 37, he says, Thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, which, you know, if you had to be named by the apostles, man, what a name, you know? I wonder what some of our names would be. Maybe some of us don't want to know. But a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You see, what's amazing about this, it's kind of an eye showing, Luke is kind of showing that there's a new covenant and it's Christ. You see, because Levites were not able to own property. But we see that he was from Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. He had transferred to Jerusalem, acquired a piece of property, whether from Cyprus or in somewhere around Jerusalem, so for a Levite to do that during that time was no easy task. That was no easy task at all. But he saw the need. He saw the need of his community. He saw the need of his brothers and sisters in Christ. And he sold that property and he wasn't looking for any accolades. He wasn't looking for any praise, but he simply walked up and gave the <clears throat> funds at the apostles' feet. There was no law that said he had to do that. There was none. There was no law that said, oh, hey, you only have to give this much. But he gave it all. What an encouragement for us. What encouragement as we look at this example of a man 
that we would see his faith. We would kind of see his heart that as Luke is pointing him out here. How encouraging is that for us? How encouraging it is that Luke is showing him here as an example of what a cheerful giver looks like. That's what he's showing here. But he's also showing him as a sharp and stark contrast to Ananias and Sapphira. And I think in doing so, we kind of see where, who we need to follow and what we need to be like with Barnabas. You see, the next part here is we see the covert sins of the saints. And this is the backdrop where as we look to Barnabas that we see Ananias and Sapphira, who I want to be upfront and honest, I believe after studying in this text, I believe that they were believers, that they w- did trust in God. And I think I can say that because um, even though some commentaries disagree, but a lot of them that I read did agree that they were believers. And I say this because I think we see this in the context that we, they're in the context they were among believers. And that's what we see. And the, now the full number of those who believe from Acts 4.32, he's kind of given the picture of those who did believe. We also see from the scriptures that they did have an involvement with the Holy Spirit when they lied. They said, you didn't lie to man, you lied to the Holy Spirit, which is God. So they did have the involvement with the Holy Spirit. And even though that God killed them for their hypocrisy, that we see that God uses death, physical death, in a form of way of chastisement as here on this earth, and yet, but they're raised with glorification as well. And then, I think fourthly, I think it makes more sense in this context for us as a church to see them and their lesson and their sin, because the Bible paints a picture of of, of those who are in sin and who are not walking godly but are considered to be godly people. And I think we can get the message out of that also for what that means for us as they were walking in sin and what they should have done. It makes more sense to see them as believers in that. But the first thing we see is their covert sin, is that they had spiritual deception. Acts 5, 1 through 2 says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, at first you might go, oh, this isn't no big deal. But the problem was is that they were deceiving people, and they were in together on it. They had full knowledge. His wife even had full knowledge, which we'll see here in just a second. And so they saw the opportunity to make really double the profit. They wanted to kind of double down, so to speak. They wanted to get all the accolades because they saw Barnabas, and I'm I'm sure they saw others who were called the son of encouragement. Man, that sounds great. What a great title that would be for someone, right? Be called the son of encouragement among brethren. Man, that would just be great. And so they saw this prestige And so they said, how can we get that title? How can people praise our name? Ananias and Sapphira, man, what great Christians, what great people. Oh, look how, look at them laying it down at the apostles' feet. But at the same time of wanting that title, they also wanted the prophet. The problem with that is there was no law that said they couldn't give everything or could keep some of it back. That's what we see in verse 4, right? There was no law that says, hey, you had to give everything. But the problem is when you start presenting like you gave everything, but you did not, you're you're lying. So we see them as that they were spiritual posers, right? They pretended to give more than what they actually gave. They were posing as being sacrificial. They were posing as giving everything. And then they were also praise seekers. They were seeking that. But where did this hypocrisy come from? Right? I mean, it kind of it kind of grew down, and then it kind of started taking root and, and, and coming up. 
And how does God look at that? Does God enjoy seeing hypocrisy in his church? No, it's one of the things God hates. God hates hypocrisy. We see this in Matthew 6, 1 through 4. When Jesus is telling his disciples, addressing the, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees about giving, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you. See, when the Pharisees would give, they would give large sums of money. They would sound trumpets throughout the streets. Oh, someone gave. Oh, good job. Good job. They would seek praise. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Right? Be humble about it. Have humility. So that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. See, when Ananias and Sapphira, they got their hands mixed up. They both knew what was going on and they were both playing the part. They wanted to show everyone how great their giving was. They were hypocrites because their giving wasn't great. They were lying about it. But we see the spiritual perception of their covert sin as Peter is um, acknowledged by the Spirit what is happening. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? See, everyone knew that they thought that they were giving everything, but they weren't. And while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. You see, they were greedy. See, this idea is to keep part of it. They were trying to say that they were giving everything, but what they're really doing is embezzling the money. They're stealing from the church. They were saying they were giving everything, but they weren't. And see, this this reminds us of Joshua 7. This Ananias and Sapphira is really the same story as in the Old Testament as Achan is, as when they destroyed Jericho. They said, don't take any of the stuff. It's devoted to God. But Achan, what did he do? He took this stuff, he buried it, and he was trying to treasure that up. Not what God was given to. He wasn't looking to God, he was looking to stuff. And so what happened? Joshua called them all out, and then the the lot fell on Achan, and he said, Achan, admit your sin, and he admitted it. But yet God still struck punishment and killed them. So this story is, is likened to Achan in the Old Testament, but it's Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. And God wants his bride to be pure. That is what God wants his church to be. He does not want them to be greedy, nor does he want them to be Satan's instruments. You see what he said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So we knew that they were involved with the Holy Spirit. They had their involvement there. They, but yet, They opened the door for Satan to come in and to fill them with this hypocrisy, which then they did not repent of it, and it took root, and it grew, and it grew until it bore fruit. See, we know Satan can be involved in believers. To think that they can't is just really asinine. You see, we see in Matthew 16... When Jesus is telling his disciples about his resurrection, his death and resurrection, what did Peter say? Lord, let it not be so. And what did Jesus say to him? Get back from me, Satan. Get back from me. We see in Ephesians 6, 12, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Right? We wrestle against 
with Satan. And first Peter, even Peter, I, I can just imagine him seeing this story, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. And he says, be sober minded, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We are to be on guard about spiritual warfare against Satan and against his forces. We are not to let uh, sin take root. That's why as a church, we are so serious about sin. Because God is serious about it. But we also see who is ultimately responsible for sin, right? It's no excuse to say, Satan made me do it. You see, we live in a world today where people struggle with certain things with homosexuality, and it's just, oh, I was born this way. Or, you know, I, I'm, I'm born with the genes of alcoholism or whatnot or any type of struggles. We like to pass off judgment is my point. Just because Satan is tempting us doesn't mean the bottom dollar starts, stops with him. We are responsible for it. I think that's what we see, too. You see, the responsibility for the sin rests on Ananias and Sapphira. And we are responsible for our sin. That's why there was swift punishment on Ananias and Sapphira. Listen to this. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. So after, and not after Peter addressed and acknowledged the sin and confronted the sin, and that's what we are to do, we are to confront sin and brothers, right? God brought judgment, swift punishment. And he fell down, dead. Whether he died of a heart attack or some unknown cause, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but he died right there as a punishment. And so what happened is that they went out and just because of the time during that time that if someone died, and especially a believer, they buried him, and usually within three hours. So that's why it says after three hours and Sapphira came in, she lied as well, boom, died as well. And then they took her out and buried her as well. And I think this is important here. I think this is very important for us, especially a lesson that we see for, for women too is that sometimes it is sinful for a wife to submit to her husband. When she puts her husband before God and follows her husband in sin, that is sin. First and foremost, she is to submit to God and her husband is to lead her in godly ways. A lot of times I speak to a lot of people that they talk about how, well, I invite him to church. Well, my husband doesn't go. Yeah, but you are still to submit to God and go to church. And we see that a woman is the first, she first belongs to God. And that is how we are to treat them, that they first belong to God as men, and that we are to lead them in godly ways. But when we look at this judgment, it was instantaneous. And some people might even go, man, you might even see yourself being a hypocrite. You might go, man, that seems extreme. That seems like so intense judgment from God. I mean, don't people do worse things like commit murder or rob someone or kidnap someone or do other things illegally? Just being a hypocrite on the inside? I mean, is that really, does it deserve that much judgment? You see, you might minimize this offense. 
because you're minimizing the one who it's offending. You see, grace, when you looked at grace, I'm like, man, I, I know God, it, it, grace is not a free pass to sin, but it's a pass to be free from sin. Right? It's, it's not for us to just go on sinning. You see, the action of God was meant to impress upon the church the seriousness of sin to the saints. The point here is that God is wanting his church to be pure and he's wanted to be holy. In order for that to happen, there must be a healthy fear of God. That's what we see it cost. And great fear in verse 11 came upon the whole church and upon all who had heard these things. You see, there was a great fear. And that's what church discipline does, right? When we confront sin as a church, as a whole, it creates a fear of God. It takes us to have a, uh, it makes us self-examine ourselves, right? So you can just imagine people during this time, Ananias, you know, as they died literally and God punished them and disciplined them in front of the whole congregation, thousands of people. I don't know who it was, but someone said, man, you could just imagine the offering the next day, right? But we understand. And in conclusion, we can conclude what they needed, what Ananias and Sapphira needed. And it's what we need as well. They needed a healthy fear of the Lord. To read this story and go, oh man, that was Ananias and Sapphira. That would never happen to me. You know what that is? You're mocking God. You're mocking his word to think that that could never happen to you. See, Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of, the, of God is the beginning of wisdom. We are, as a church, to have a, ha- a healthy fear of God, and we're to bow down in awe of God. We're to trust in Christ because of the awe of God. We're to repent of sin because of the holiness and awe of God. Secondly, Ananias and Sapphira, they needed to apply the gospel. You see, whether they understood it completely or they just didn't apply it deep down in their hearts, they didn't have a healthy application of the gospel. You see, the gospel, understanding what Christ had done, frees us from addictions. It frees us from worldly possessions. It frees us from being pretenders or posers. It frees us from wanting praise from people. It frees us from lying, from stealing, from deceiving. And instead, it makes us honest. It makes us humble. It makes us generous. It sets our minds and our hearts on the glory of God. So they needed to apply the gospel. And it's the same thing in our hearts every time we sin. We need to apply the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That's why we have to have a healthy message of the gospel. And finally, this couple needed to live in repentance. That's what they needed. Instead of it giving and taking root and trusting what Satan was trying to promise them, oh, you're going to have praise. Oh, you're going to have a new name. They needed to repent of their hypocrisy. They needed to kill it right then. To end on an illustration, some of y'all might have heard this, is that a little thing about me is that I, deep down, I truly love to garden. I love to make stuff. I love to see stuff grow. And um, one year I had this garden. It was actually the second year I had a garden. My brother, or my wife's brother-in-law came and he tilled it up and and you know, the year before we had all kinds of stuff. I mean, we had lettuce that Jackson ran his four-wheeler over. Um, we had corn, tomatoes, pe- I mean, I had it all. I mean, I had it all. So the next year we tilled it up and it was time. It was one of those years that like you tilled it like when you were supposed to, and then you were supposed to go out and plant all this stuff, but yet it rained. And so you couldn't 
planet. And so it rained a few days, and then all of a sudden stuff started popping up. I'm like, these stocks started popping up. And I thought, oh my gosh, we have wild corn. <laughs> and so, you know, then it rained a couple more times. I couldn't pull them, I couldn't kill them. So they, I just like, man, wild corn, this is amazing. And so I let it grow. And then when I brought someone over, I, I, mean, I'm a, I was like excited. I'm like, come and look at my garden. Come on in the back, you know, I got wild corn. And then the reality hit. It said, James, that's not wild corn. That's Johnson grass. <laughs> and man, I was in trouble. I mean, I don't know if you know much about Johnson grass. You can't kill it. I mean, it is like you see it pop up. Man, go to Burdines or Nelson's, get the poison and just poison it because that's the only way you're going to kill it as soon as you see it. Because if you just pull it up, man, those apparently those root systems, I got really good with those root systems. Um, if you break the root, when you pull up one, two grow in its place. I found that out. And so my point is this. When sin is in your life, kill it immediately when you self-examine yourself don't let it take root don't do it there is nothing good to come from it i didn't have a garden that year because of johnson grass you might have a promised life in christ but you'll be grieving the spirit if you let sin take root in your life and it'll bear fruit it'll bear fruit kill it repent of it immediately let's pray god we thank you so much for today for this time that we get to gather together as your church lord i pray that this church be bold that they would be bold in preaching the gospel that we would be bold to have unity in this church to have one mindset one heartbeat that we would be one body that moves together to look, to spread the gospel to each other, to care for each other and our needs, and to seek and to see the lost being saved through the message of Jesus Christ. God, let us also be a pure and holy church, purging ourselves of sin, repenting of it, not letting it take root and bear fruit, but God, that we would kill it immediately, trusting in Christ, looking to Him. Even though we wrestle in the flesh, God, let us remind ourselves through your word that our life is hidden with Christ. It's not us who live, but it's he who lives in us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.